All right, I will be reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So put away all malice and all deceit, deceit and hypocrisy and envy and, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may, be, you may grow up into salvation. If needed, you have, you have tasted that the Lord is good uh, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice and acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last week, my name is Greg Anderson, and it is great to be back at the Mesa Church of Christ. You surprised me with something. I have to confess, you surprised me with something. I had no idea you were such a great singing church. Yeah. I mean, that yeah, really blessed me this morning to be able to hear. And last week, I so enjoyed and was just fed by the, the singing, uh, our time of singing together. Um, and so, yeah, it's great. It's really good. Really, really good. We had a young lady who visited our church. This was a couple of months back, and uh, she, uh, she grew up in a different faith tradition. And she said, I'm surprised you all don't have a chorus. And I said, well, we do. Everybody's in it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and so you guys did a great job as the, the chorus of saints coming together this morning to sing, and praise, sing praises to our Lord. So thankful, thankful for that. And man, I just keep getting blessed more and more and more by your hospitality Thank you for your kindness and your smiles. I haven't seen a single person frown yet. Does anybody here frown? Anybody at all? Please don't yell out names, okay? That's not a good thing. But uh, anyway, thrilled, thrilled to be back with you this Sunday. I will not be here next week. Uh, I'm here about three Sundays a month. And so next Sunday is a holiday weekend, the 4th of July. Some folks will be traveling and us included. We're going to see our son who lives in Tulsa with uh, his wife and, and a new child, our second grandchild, who's just now six weeks old. And so that's going to be a lot of fun. So appreciate your prayers for a safe travel. And I look forward to being back with you that second Sunday in uh, July. Well, last Sunday, we spent some time examining the greater context of what I believe is one of the most formative passages in all of the New Testament. And that's from Galatians chapter 5. And I just want to read a few verses here this morning, verses 22 and 23, as we kind of reorient around part two of what we referred to last week as living in the and. The Apostle Paul writes, and he's talking here about the fruit of the Spirit, and he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things, against things like this, there is no law. So last Sunday we noted that this particular text is situated in a greater context of what we referred to as the great and between two trees, the tree of life that we encounter in the book of Genesis chapter 2, and that same tree of life that we see again in Revelation 22. So the beginning of the Word of God and the end of the Word of God, we start uh, and end focusing on this same tree. Here are the texts that we looked at last Sunday. Genesis 2, beginning at verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And to go all the way to the end of your Bible, that's in the beginning, go all the way to the end in Revelation 22, beginning in verse 1. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, John writes, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Praise God. So this tree of life, the tree of life in the garden and the tree of life in the new Jerusalem serve as great bookends to the story of God from Genesis to Revelation. And as I said, we referred last Sunday to this as between these two contexts as the great 
and. And and is a very intriguing word. Um, it can be used to show relationships. We have any mac and cheese fans in the room, okay? Mac and cheese, all right. Peanut butter and jelly, okay, very good. Chocolate and anything, right? I mean, that's one of those, uh, one of those great uh, causal relationships there. Uh, it can also be used to identify a state of being in between this time and that time. And that's the application that we're looking for today and throughout our interim season. And as we noted last week, life between the trees, life in the great and, well, it can be pretty challenging. But if you remember, we also discovered last Sunday that if we reframe our understanding, it powers us by God's holiness to, to be people of, of hope in Christ and to be people who live purposefully for Christ, and then to legitimately offer good news to other people. Last Sunday, we also said that the world God intended is not the world we live in, but the world we live in provides opportunity for us to restore the world that God intended. And I, I think this is incredibly important. If you remember, we asked this question, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we, how do we help restore the world that God intended? And I ask you uh, to consider this answer to that question. We do the same thing that Adam and Eve were created to do. We work to take care of what God has given us. And I think... That's one of our primary responsibilities when it comes to how we spend our time and our energies as we live in the end. And what is the great end? Isn't it just a collection of little ands? You may remember a, a list that I showed last Sunday. We live in the ups and downs of life. We live in the good and bad. We live in life and death, and you can see the other things that are listed there. Sometimes these are referred to as polarities of life, and we learn to navigate these as followers of Jesus to the glory of God. We could take all afternoon and talk about this. We couldn't exhaust the possibilities of the ands that we encounter in this lifetime. And I want you to see this visually, right? If, if this end of the stage represents the very, very beginning and this end of the stage represents the very, very end. So if this is Genesis 1 and this is Revelation 22, think about all of the tens of thousands of ands that occur individually and collectively, hundreds of thousands, millions of ands that we experience um, but we acknowledge these ands that we are in. We can do that, and we can decide how we're going to respond to God's leading, no matter how many ands we encounter. So a question for us today is, how will we use our ands? How will we use our ands? There are so many answers to that question, it's kind of hard to find a place to start, I think. Uh, but my prayer today is that we will never lose sight of using our and times, and particularly this season of and that you are in as a church family. Uh, my prayer is that we will never lose sight of using our and times to be bearers of the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. So if you think about it, how will we live in the end? It's, it's one of the key questions that Paul answers in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Paul, Paul shows us here how the life of Christ becomes our life, or collectively our lives. Through the power of the resurrected Christ, Paul says, love one another. Express joy together. Practice patience. Be kind. Be good. Be faithful. Be gentle. Practice self-control. The, the fruit that he talks about here is, 
it's an expression, it's an outcome of an earlier truth that he states back in chapter 2 in verse 20, where he writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. You see the relationship? You see how the fruit of the Spirit is an outcome of what Christ does in us when we give our, our, our hearts to him fully? Paul, Paul doesn't just talk about the fruit of the Spirit. His very life serves as an example of what the fruit of the Spirit looks like lived out behaviorally as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I, I want to draw your attention to a passage in Acts chapter 20 this morning as we examine how Paul, how Paul himself handled one of the most significant and moments of his life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Luke records, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. And I've declared to both the Jews and the Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. You hear the tension of this and moment in Paul's life? I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And there's a couple of things in this passage that just really get my attention. Anytime I read through the text, I always try to look for those first things that jump out at me and then take the deeper dive as I study more and more. Uh, but I just want to pass these along this morning for your consideration. The first is this. When facing a major turning point in his life, in his ministry, Paul, I just think this is brilliant. Paul reaches out to others in the church. Um, and it's fascinating to me this, this relationship that he has with the Ephesian elders. I want to come back and talk more about that here in just a moment. But I want you to notice that, that this is an apostle we're talking about. Um, there's this direct link with, with uh, Paul to God, to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus himself. And yet what does he do? He chooses to reach out to other people in the middle of this, this and moment in his life. I spend a lot of time studying our culture. I try to figure out where we've been and where we are and where we're, we're going. And, and there's something that I've concluded uh, as I've kind of analyzed our culture. I, I believe that our individualism, I think it's one of the primary things that's I think it's killing us, actually. Um, our me focus. I can do this. I know what's best. If only everybody else would see things my way. Well, if I had my way, does any of that sound familiar to you? Any of that at all? Paul, let's think about this. Paul is an apostle. On the road to Damascus, Jesus speaks to Paul out loud. Later, the Holy Spirit speaks to Paul. 
Often he guides Paul's pen. Sometimes Paul tells us, this is my opinion, but, but most of the time in his writing, the Holy Spirit is actually speaking to Paul, guiding his pen. And yet this man who directly hears the voice of God, this man who is led directly by the Holy Spirit, he, he reaches out to others. And so here's lesson one from this text of how we use our end time. In the end, reach out to and pray with others. You've got this phenomenal end opportunity as a church. Can you imagine if five, six, seven months from now, whenever your minister stands up here on this stage and is being introduced to this congregation, it, you're, as you're looking back in your rearview mirror, if you were able to say to one another, that was one of the most profound prayer seasons of my life. That was the time, those, those months that we spent as a church co-laboring together. I don't know that I've ever felt drawn closer to my brothers and sisters in Christ. And that, can you imagine the launching pad that gives you as a body of believers as you live into your future? So connect with, pray with one another in this season of the end. And I think this also is really important. I see this in the passage here. Our aim impacts our and. Our aim impacts our and. Anybody in the room ever teach your children to drive? Anybody? Okay. What was one of the primary rules you always told your, where, where do you keep your eyes? You keep your eyes ahead, right? Now you can check the mirror occasionally and that kind of thing, but what do we want our children aiming for? Staying on the road, right? It's a pretty important piece. I want you to notice what Paul here, I want you to notice what Paul is aiming at, okay? Let's go back and look here in verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Do you see what he says here next? My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now, i got to tell you something, church family. I, I don't really hear this kind of language very much these days. Um, when asked, hey, what are you up to today? How many of us reply, well, my only aim today is to testify to the good news of God's grace? I mean, you just don't hear that very much, right? If there ever was, however, a better target worth aiming for, can you, can you think of one? Can you imagine if at your funeral, if everyone who passed by your casket, can you imagine if they said, you know, his only aim or, or her only aim was to testify to the good news of God's grace? That'd be using our and times to a God-honoring end, wouldn't it? I want to shift just a little bit here. First, connect with one another, pray with one another, consider your aim in this season of and, and hopefully, prayerfully, consider aiming to being people of good news about God's grace. But I also want to shift here just a little bit to see something that's quite intriguing to me in this text. Paul could have reached out to anybody uh, in this season of being in the and. But he chooses here to reach out to the elders of the church. And if you study at all, then I'm so grateful that uh, our brother Ashby is in the book of Acts. And so you're actually going to take a deeper dive into this, this Acts 20 passage in a, in a few weeks, I assume, if you, stay on, if you stay on track. So if you can't be here in, for, in person for that, then please be sure to watch the recording because I think it'll bring so much more meaning even to this text. But Paul has a special bond with the elders at Ephesus. He spent a lot of time there, at least three years that we know of, that he was in Ephesus. And they had some pretty challenging times there. Uh, there were some very interesting characters in Ephesus and some really interesting things happened there. But he chooses here to reach out to these elders in Ephesus. He, he had appointed many of them, I'm sure. He had worked side by side with them. He had countered blessings. He had also encountered hardships. And through the testing of their faith, he knew that he could draw strength from their character and from their courage and from their commitment to the cause of Christ Jesus. Paul could have reached out to anybody, but he chose to reach out to the elders of the church. I, I think that tells us that Paul had a very uh, powerful spiritual bond 
uh, with these fellow servants and vice versa. And that's not all. It's not all. This is where this really starts to get intriguing to me. Luke could have recorded any of Paul's speeches to Christians. But as far as I can tell, there's only one speech to Christians from Paul in the book of Acts. Now, he addresses a lot of other people, but as far as I can, as far as I can tell, this is his only speech to, to Christians. And his speech that Luke records is to the elders of the church. So there's something going on here. There's a threat in the mix. And it's not just a threat to Paul's life, but it's a, a threat to the actual life of the church in Ephesus. And so the text continues as Paul speaks to these brothers and he says, keep watch over yourselves. And all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He says to the elders, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Now, I want you to know that I'm not sharing this text today because I'm afraid savage wolves are about to come in on the heels of Terry's transition, okay? Uh, Terry and I had lunch last Sunday. He didn't mention a single savage wolf, all right? So that's a, that's a really, really good thing. But, but in Paul's case, this phenomenon, it's already occurring in Ephesus. As opponents of Paul are, are trying to discredit him, they're whispering about him. They're saying, well, you know, Paul did this or did that or thinks this or think that. They're trying to prejudice others against the validity of his teaching. And Paul, quite frankly, he just fears here that things are just going to get worse. As a matter of fact, he continues, even from your own number. Men will arise, they will distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul encourages the elders here to be on their guard because sometimes in the end, that's when people often strive to find extremes to which to gravitate. But I want you to notice one of the final pieces of this in the end moment. And, and again, I'm just fascinated by what is recorded here, what happens here. They could have chosen any response. I mean, there were hundreds of trajectories, hundreds of possibilities before them. They could have chosen any response, any approach, any type of send off for this brother who they love deeply. But I want you to notice what happens. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And this just isn't a call for the Ephesian elders to pray. I love this insight by F.F. F. Bruce who writes the speech. It's not only his farewell speech to them and to the church that they represented, but so far as the perspective of Acts is concerned, his last will and testament to the churches, which he had planted both east and west of the Aegean Sea. So this speech, it's a final call to elders everywhere. Elders in the great end between two trees and elders in the many ands of the life of the church. And that brings us full circle to Galatians chapter 5. Before a fruit tree is planted, the ground has to be prepared. And to prepare physical ground, we use turning plows and cultivators and various other instruments to get the soil ready for the desired outcome, which is physical fruit, right? You plant a peach orchard, you hope someday to be able to harvest peaches, but you got to get the ground ready first. Spiritually speaking, we use God's word and prayer 
and fasting and various other spiritual disciplines to get our hearts ready for the desired outcome, which is, as we see in Galatians 5, spiritual fruit. And here's my prayer. Here's my prayer for the Mesa Church of Christ. I pray that over the next many months that you and I will form the type of bond that Paul shared with these brothers in Ephesus. But not just you and me. I I pray that all of us grow in the strength, that type of bond. I pray that, that in a time of uncertainty, culturally speaking, that our primary aim will be to testify to the good news of God's grace. And I also hope that your appreciation for your elders and your love for one another, I pray that we experience growth in those areas as we encourage one another to be Holy Spirit fruit bearers in this place. Um, how, how, How wonderful would it be if when your new preaching minister has spent his first several months with you, how wonderful would it be if after he's been here for several months, When someone asks him, so, how's it going? How wonderful would it be if his immediate response is, I have never in my life seen a more loving, joyful, peace-filled, kind, and faithful church family. How awesome would that be? So my question to you is, how are you going to get there? You're already off to a great start thanks to a wonderful decade-plus ministry of Terry and many others who've labored in this place. But I want to encourage you to remember this one thing, church. Your aim impacts your end. So, as we work together, aim well. Aim well. And then let's be prepared to stand in awe, to stand in awe as we witness the fruit of the Spirit harvest that we've touched on the last couple of Sundays. We're going to share a song together this morning, and we call this in Churches of Christ a a song of invitation or a song of encouragement. And I noticed last week a couple of the church shepherds came down to the front. I assume that's something that happens every Sunday. And so if you want to pray with someone this morning, this is just one of the means that we do that. If you're not too excited about uh, coming forward in front of a big crowd, please know I hang around afterward for a little bit, and I'm very happy to visit with you one-on-one. Maybe you want to be baptized and, and begin this journey of becoming a Holy Spirit fruit bearer. Maybe you're just going through a very, very difficult season or you're really struggling with something and you need the prayers of the saints and the encouragement of the saints to, uh, to bring you back into uh, that life of, of, of being a fruit bearer. Whatever is on your heart, we're just going to stand together. We're going to sing a song together. If you want to make your way down to the front for any reason, let's do that now.